Today, um, we're going to introduce a new topic and a new unit, unit two, um, and we're going to start talking about a, um, functions. And so functions are um, relationships where there are input and outputs. And in order for something to be a function, every input can only have one output. Okay, so for order for something, there's all sorts of relationships okay, that we can create in math between two variables okay, or between two elements. But in order for that relationship to be considered a function, every input can only have one output, okay? And so we have these input values. And typically um, we look at a lot of relations that are X and Y um, and functions that are X and Y for our two elements in our function. And many times the input value are X values so for every X value that we put in, um, we call those values the domain of our function. And then we have output values. And so the input values we put in, we evaluate something and we get out an output value, typically our Y value, not always, but um, in a kind of typical function that we're gonna look at, especially when we talk about function form or slope intercept form. Um, and these are called our range. So we have a domain and a range for our function. And so here um, we're given a relationship. We're being told that these are functions um, and we wanna list the domain and the range. And so here I have my inputs and then in, on the right hand side, I have my outputs. And for this particular example, they've organized um, the inputs and the outputs in a table. In the other example, you'll notice that they organize them as ordered pairs. The domain for this function, which would be the set of my input values, would be negative three, five, zero, and nine. That's listing the domain of this function, my input values. The range of this function would be four, six, seven, and negative seven. So I have a domain and a range. Now on my next example, it organizes um, my input and outputs a little bit differently. And so here we have ordered pairs, which means an X value and then a Y value. So each of the X values would be a part of my domain. So I'm negative three, zero, one, and seven. And each of the Y values would be a part of my range for eight, six, and 11, okay? Now, what we wanna be able to do is determine if something is a function. And so that looks different depending on um, what information we're given to determine that. But our kind of golden idea here is that in order for it to be a function, every input can only have one output. So here I have some domain and range tables. So domain, meaning we know that these are the inputs and these are the outputs. Okay, I put in negative three to my function and it gives me out three. I put in negative two and it gives me out negative six. Put in negative one, I get out zero. When I put in zero, I get 15. And when I put in one, I get negative one. So every input only mapped to one possible output. So this is an example of a function. But on my next example, so here's an input, input to this output, input to this output, input to this output. When I get to the last in, um, input value or domain value, notice that it maps to two different outputs. So this input of one goes to either zero or 15. That makes this not a function because you have an input that's going to more than one output. On the next example, all of my inputs go to the same output, 
that's fine. Okay, that just means that no matter what I put in, I'm getting negative six out um, in this function, but still it follows the rule, right? Every input only has one output. Doesn't matter that it's the same output. This is a function. Uh, on my last table, every input goes to only one output. This is a function. Okay, so that's one way um, that we determine if something, oh, you know what, let's go back. I'm going to go back because I'm gonna ask you to do the next two. So on a couple of these functions, so let's do the last two. My domain here, so for my domain, I have five values, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, and one. For my range, I only have one output value or one value in my range. Here's my domain, here's my range. So it's not always true that the number of elements you have in your domain match the number of elements you have in your range. Same idea here, I could give my domain negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one in my range. And this one happens to have the same number of elements in both. Okay, there's my domain, there's my range. So on the next page, it gives you two more tables and it asks you to decide, okay, given this relation, so we're not told it's a function, we're said, here's a relationship. These are the things I put in, this is what I get out. That's the relationship that's shown in the table. So first you wanna decide, is this relationship a function? If it's not a function, identify why it's not. Um, and then give the domain and the range for each, okay? So I'm gonna give you a moment to try A and B on your own. Um, and then we will uh, look into how to determine a function from a graph. Okay, so you can see from my work, our first relation is not a function. And that's because three, this input maps to two different outputs. So that's why, and here's my domain and here's my range. On the second table, this is a function because every input only goes to one output. It just happens to be that these three inputs all go um, to seven, all map to seven. So that's one skill that we wanna have is determining whether or not a table is representing a function. We also wanna be able to look at a graph and determine if something is a function given a graph. So for that, we use our vertical line test which means if I were to draw a vertical line, so if a vertical line hits more than one point on the graph, then it is not a function. So I'm gonna give you a few examples and we'll talk about why this vertical line test works. So here's our few examples. It says, this is a function. So here's the vertical line. You can see they kind of drew in a vertical line here and it's only hitting one point. Whereas here, here's my vertical line. It's hitting two points of that graph. So I know it's not a function. This is a function that's not a function. Same here, if I draw a vertical line, it's hitting two points on this graph, it's not a function. Okay, now the reason that is, if I think about um, ordered pairs here, so let's just pretend that this is an X value of three. Um, and let's pretend that this is a Y value of four and that down here is a Y value of negative four. If I think about ordered pairs or a table, this would tell me that I have a point that's at three, four and a point that's at three, negative four, okay? That means that this input has two outputs. So it's really the same rule as when I'm looking at a table. If I were to make a table of values here, three goes to four and goes to negative four and draw it the way those other tables were, this input, this X value is going to two Y values. Same idea here, this X value is going to two Y values. Whereas on this graph for every X value, it's only going to one Y value on my graph. Okay, so that's kind of, it's all the same, but when we look at a table, we're kind of keeping in mind, well, every input, we only want one output. That's still true for a graph. It's just easier to look and see, well, 
does a vertical line hit two points, um, which is seen if, the, if there's an input that has more than one output. Okay, that's what that vertical line is doing. So underneath here, you see six graphs, and I'm gonna give you a moment to decide if they are functions or not a function, um, and then continue the recording and see how you did. So now I'll give you a moment to check and see how you did. How do your answers compare to my answers? And so the two that are not a function, this one's pretty obvious, it's hitting two points. Um, on this graph, like if I were to draw a vertical line over here, I'm only hitting one point. But here I'm hitting three points. So it's not a function if anywhere on the graph it breaks that rule of I'm hitting more than one point when I draw a vertical line. So that's the first piece. Now the second piece that we're gonna talk about with functions is definitely a little bit more challenging, um, but it's really understanding the concept of why um, things are written the way they're written more than anything else. So we're gonna look today, and this is the last thing we're gonna talk about for today, at what's called function notation. And so what I'm going to do is underneath here, I'm going to write y equals 3x plus seven. Now this is probably something that you've seen before, an equation that's written in y equals. Now when something is written in y equals, we actually call that the function form of an equation. And the reason it's called function form, if we think about what a function is, is every input we get out an output. So it's function form because it's set up really nicely to substitute in values and get a y value out. So substitute in for x, get y out. Um, if it was written in another way, there'd be kind of a little bit more work involved there. But with this setup, whatever I put in for x, I'm going to get I'm going to just be able to do three times that number plus seven, and I'll get out whatever y, the y value is. So that's called function form. Now, really, this up above is exactly the same <laughs> as this here. But what we're doing is we're replacing y with function notation. So this is a function, function f. And um, here in function form, y is a function of x, okay? So x is the input, y is the output. Here, this is saying my function f of x. So my function of x is 3x plus 7. It's exactly the same as what's down here, but it's using a different notation. And so function notation really is saying, so we're able to read it as the function when x equals something is something. So let's, let me do an example and I'll explain why we even like function notation. Um, and so what happens too, in terms of input output, we're gonna put in X and then we're going to evaluate X. We're gonna plug in X here. And this is what we got out when we plugged in an X value. So for example, if I wanted to evaluate my function when X is two, Okay, so this is how function notation works. So it's not like 2f. It's not 2 times f, like we think about in our equations from unit one. This is a notation. So it's saying, here's a function. We're going to call this function f. What happens to function f when I plug in 2 for x? And then all we're going to do is direct substitution here. So when I plug in 2 for x, it looks like this. My function f when x is two is six plus seven. My function when x is two is 13. And so the benefit of writing in function notation, and notice I'm not like, right, it's not two f. I don't need to divide by two and solve for f. That's not what we're doing anymore, okay? This is just notation so that I can see I put in this and I get out 13. Okay, so in this function, which operates the same as this, if I put in two for X, I'd get out 13 for Y. If I put in two for X, my function would give me out 13. Okay, so when X equals two, Y equals 13, okay? 
Now we're going to look at a few more functions and then I'll let you try some on your own. Okay, so let's look at um, the functions on this left-hand side. So notice the letters change. So here I have a function K, a function G, sometimes it's a function H. That doesn't really matter. That's just giving me a letter to identify what function I'm talking about. So we want to evaluate um, function K when X is three. So it says find K at three. So my function K when X is three would equal three squared plus one. My function when X is three would equal nine plus one. My function K when X is three would equal 10. And so what's really important and what I will take points off for is you don't lose this notation. Okay, I'm not just gonna write 10 and circle it. We want it written this way so that again, we can see what did I plug in and what do I get out? So I see it in that function form. Okay, K of three equals 10. And that links to like input output, right? So that if I were to graph something, that goes to an ordered pair where X is three or my input is three and my output is 10. Okay, so we wanna be writing our answer so we can see both what did you substitute in and what did you get out? Same idea for three. So this is saying find our function when um, X is negative six or really in this case T. So notice here, I may have said X up above two. This is N, so I'm plugging three in for N. This is T, um, so when I have negative six, I'm plugging negative six in for T. My function when T is negative six equals three times negative six subtract three. Or my function when X is negative six equals negative 18 subtract three. My function when X is or T is negative six is negative 21. When I put in negative six, I get out negative 21. Five is tricky because of the negatives. So my function K um, when T is negative four. So K of negative four equals negative four squared subtract negative four. So just being really careful when I substitute in this value for T. Negative four squared would give me positive 16 minus a negative makes this addition. And my function K when X is negative four equals 20. When I put in negative four, I get out 20. So now I want you to try two, four and six on your own um, and then resume the video and see how you do. Okay, so now check your work and see how you did. So when I plug in negative nine to my function G, I get out negative 29. When I plug in one, I get out negative six. When I plug in zero, I get out negative two. And if you need to kind of look over any of these, you can pause it um, or keep the video here and check your work. Um, see if it's a positive negative thing more than anything else probably. And also make sure that your answers are written in this way, where you have the function notation is equal to um, whatever output that input has, uh, has given you. Okay, well, we'll continue functions tomorrow. Um, and this is it for homework today. There'll be um, certainly more practice with function notation um, once we complete the notes um, tomorrow.